This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Today's guest is ready to become an empty nester and start living the dream most 40-somethings dream of. But God spoke to Minnie Thibault through her husband with a word that would spin heads for most spouses. Since then, their families more than doubled. Uh, this is truly amazing. From your youngest to graduating high school, I think in 2009, to two years later, raising three more girls, all under six months old. Uh, either God gave a word to you and your husband or both of you are in need of psychological help. I'm not sure which. <laughs> well, how do you get to that? I mean, you're graduating and people are saying, hey, it's time to pay off the mortgage and dance around the house and praise God, my kids are adults. And then, wow, God says, yeah. Yeah, no, I want you to start another family. Yeah. Add to this family. Yes. Well, you should interview my husband sometime because he could really answer that. <laughs> <laughs> well, did, did, the word came to, did the word come to him first and then he and you, yeah. you confirmed it because God was telling you the same thing at the same time? Yes. So he had basically been crying out to the Lord, uh, let's do something different. You know, we're now <laughs> retired, so to speak. Yeah. Let's let's do something that's really going to make a mark in the earth. And we both were watching something that was talking about adoption. And three days later, he came to me and said, I can't shake this. I keep hearing the Lord that we're to adopt a baby. And I said, well, I'm hearing the same thing. And literally... Oh. Nine months later, we were holding our first newborn adoption. Wow. And it's, 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 a lot of people, it's, it's kind of tough to even adopt. But you guys, from nine months on, I mean, from that point, you, when you guys heard the word, that baby was conceived. And yes. nine months later, you're, you're, you're adopting that child that, that is yours. Yes. I am really uh, thankful to the Lord of the way that he showed us to adopt uh, because in the last decade, we now have walked several couples through mm. newborn adoption. It's many who have been stalled in the midst of their adoption. This is definitely uh, the Lord's doing, and I've, I've watched dozens of families mm. adapt. Nine months is usually the longest I've seen anybody wait. Mm. So. so as he called you to that adoption, the, was the, you, you adopted a girl, and then uh -huh. how many months later did you, you end up adopting twins? <laughs> She was six months, and we said our our home study was about to expire, and it's cheaper to keep your home study up to date than to redo the whole thing. And so uh, we contacted our local agent that does our home study, and we said, hey, we need to meet with you next month before this expires. And she said, well, when you come in, bring a profile, because I have uh, twins on my desk that one has a severe heart condition, and we're having trouble uh, placing mm -hmm. both of them and uh, they were due in six weeks we said yes to them and they were born three three weeks later and I have to add one week before our youngest of our older mm -hmm. children was getting married <laughs> so, so you're planning that was a, wedding. a wild time yeah. plan a wed wedding and, and, and a baby shower at the same time yes, yes it was wild yeah. How do you explain so many, so many people have, have talked about how hard it is to adopt and how, how the struggles they've gone through. How do you explain that? I mean, God just did this. Yeah. Um, well, I believe that what I've seen is that many agencies that say that they're a newborn adoption agency really don't place that many newborns in a year. They do many of the other things. Uh, so we're connected with agencies across the nation that all they do is help mothers. Um, and so they have many mothers coming through their agency um, at a time. And so they're doing 30 plus adoptions a year, which is remarkable um, when everyone says, oh, there's no newborns. There is uh, so many women that are choosing birth plans. Uh, I mean, adoption plans. Yeah, we want to talk about that, too, how to minister to those women after they give the, that child up for adoption. But I need to explain, mm -hmm. too, we, we caught you in the car today <laughs> yes. because you're, you're, you're in a small cabin with, with the kids, and you say there's a lot of confusion, a lot of noise going on. Yes, so this is our quiet place. But on social media, all the moms do this. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, a way to, it's a way to get out. You know, you, you kind of get out and get a little, little breath of fresh air, and that, that's kind of right. nice. But, you know, God called you into the, the adoptions. That's, that's pretty radical. I mean, I don't want to say at your age, but it, it, is, it is radical. You guys were, were sure. older. Uh, but God even called you deeper. I mean, mm -hmm. 
You've got the newborn adoptions, and all of a sudden he reveals something to you that really got your attention. I mean, it's something that I don't think anybody really thinks about that much, and it's a right. whole different area of adoption. Tell me about that. So I had a moment where the Lord kind of showed me um, an image of these embryos, these frozen babies that are million that are frozen in fertility clinics. And he basically asked me if I'd be willing to loan him my womb and carry these embryos. Oh, I, I get emotional. Yeah, I like to see why. And uh, so when I brought this whole concept to my husband, he honestly said, I don't understand why the Lord would want us to do that yeah. when we are protecting the child that's already in the womb that's going to be born any day or that could possibly be aborted. Sure. And uh, so a few nights later, I ended up having a dream. And in my dream, I basically destroyed an embryo in my kitchen sink disposal. And when I woke up, I felt as if the Lord was telling me, I'm sorry, but I need you to know how important this is to me. He said, whether life is so small that the human eye can't see it or a fully formed baby uh, being torn from its mother's womb, he said, I stood before them both and declared plans and purpose and destiny that I had for them. And he said, I grieve equally for both. So when I shared that to my husband, we both basically wow. repented because as pro-life as we were, we still were putting our value, our human value on life. And the Lord says, from the minute conception happens, uh, that is important to me. Well, so yeah. it gave us a whole new perspective <laughs> on the embryos. And so we went on to adopt four embryos that were six days old, uh, three boys and one girl. They already know the DNA. It's all there. And I gave birth to the first one in 2018, oh and he's two and a half years old, and he is just a joy. Oh, my. I, I have to admit, I had, I had no idea until I read your story. I read the, read the notes on your story. And I knew there was frozen embryos and fertility uh, mm -hmm. clinics like that. But how does it come that, that uh, does the, the birth parents who have that embryo there, they, they have several embryos, they choose from one, implant that, they have the baby, and they just abandon the rest? There are several things that can happen with the rest of the embryos. Um, they can choose a family personally. They can donate the embryos back to the clinic. Uh, the clinic can send them to for science uh, purposes. Uh, there's many things. They can let them thaw. They can leave them frozen forever. There's just all kinds of um, you know craziness with them all. Uh, the clinics that we work with, um, they really encourage their families to find families or allow the clinic to find a family and um, adapt them out. So there are, there are places, there are some clinics that would just not look at that as, as life at that point in time. I mean, they could just dispose of them. Yes, they, they can dispose of them. They, I think they think, I think they think that I've heard many people say, well, it's potential. It's a potential life. Mm -hmm. And um, but they don't have the paradigm, you know, in Louisiana, though, I do want to say this. Louisiana has a law that embryos cannot be destroyed. Well, so I think that's for Louisiana to take it, taking a lead right. uh, at the that's time right. you were um, when you first had this moment, you were at the International House of Prayer. I mean, you were specifically praying uh, for the unborn at mm -hmm. that time. Right. And mm -hmm. had no idea that uh, as you saw this image that Christ was talking about frozen embryos. Yeah, I, my image that I had was actually um, Christ surrounded by bubbles. And when I got closer, the bubbles, each bubble had a baby in it. And he basically lifted his hands and said, pick one. <laughs> so um, he's very creative. <laughs> I'm thankful for him. And uh, he's taught us, my husband and I both, to not think too hard about the things that he asked us to do. Um, if it's not him, he'll shut the, door. shut the door. So I always encourage everybody I talk to. I, we speak uh, continually to hundreds of people at a time. And I, I have women at least two, three times a week emailing me, texting me, have heard my story. Um, I'm feeling this. Should I, what's, what's my confirmation? And I said, you're, I always say your confirmation is that you've heard it. Now just start walking it out. 
and the Lord will direct you. And if it's not meant to be, he'll shut the door. You don't have to worry about it. I tell all my families, you cannot make a baby come into your home, but you definitely can keep a baby coming from you, coming to your home. A lot of women that are watching this right now would think, okay, if I turn 45 or 50, that's the door shut. How do I, mm. how do I, how do I give birth again and, and care for a baby and have the energy for it and nurse a child? And how does all that happen? I mean, did you go through all of those questions for yourself? I, I did go through some of them, but I, when I feel like the Lord has uh, spoken, I know that there's a supernatural element and I've just come to learn that women and men are remarkable beings and we can do far more than we think well, that we yeah. can. And I think that our society and our culture puts limits on us and we accept those as true. And the Bible teaches me otherwise. I mean, when I gave birth, when the Lord first came to me about the embryos, I had already completed menopause. Mm -hmm. I was turning 50. And um, and I have one more baby to still carry, and I'll be 54 in just a couple days. So you don't look it. I'm going for it. It's up to the Lord, you know, yeah. what He's going to do with it all. But I know that I'm safe in His hands. Well, the the, the fact that you you uh, you became pregnant, they implanted this embryo 24 years after you'd given birth to your last child. Right. That had to. Was there any? I mean. Any fear and trepidation in that at all? It's just you're just not going to you're just not going to question the Lord in this. I'm just I I know He's going to see me through this. It was, um, you know, now that I'm caring for a toddler, mm -hmm. and uh, we have three ten year old girls too. Um, <laughs> there are moments, absolutely. I I cannot lie. I feel my age, and this is not easy to do, but. I feel like the Lord has something so special in this generation of children mm -hmm. and they need mm -hmm. to be, they need a chance, whether they're adopted as a newborn or adopted as an embryo, the Lord wants them to have a chance. He's got something planned. So I'm just a vessel and I, I know I don't mean to sound trite about it. Yeah. I just, uh, I just, I just know that Jesus wouldn't lead me down a path that wasn't, uh, that he didn't have predestined and planned for me. So we just say yes and let him work out the details. <laughs> In a moment, we'll continue our discussion with Mindy and how her passion for life has led her to create a way for thousands of men and women's voices to be heard in the battle to end abortion. As the climate in our world grows more hostile toward our Christian worldview, Viewpoint is a program designed to help defend our faith. Each week, Bob Placey interviews guests who bring the Bible into focus. And we can be salt and light in this culture. Every description of Babylon in this book is going to come to pass. Helping us understand how relevant God's Word is for today. Viewpoint is completely viewer supported. If you've enjoyed and benefited from our interviews, we would ask you to consider helping us by supporting it financially. Your 20, 50, or even $100 monthly gift will help us continue to bring you more of these programs. Go to WTLW.com now and click Get Involved, or you can send a check to the address on your screen. Thank you for supporting Viewpoint. I am back with Mindy Tebow, and she is uh, talking to us from her car today because her, her vacation cabin is full of children <laughs> and a lot of energy. And uh, amazingly, I mean, God, out of the, you guys were pro-life. Now you've become super pro-life. I mean, he called you uh, just uh, the miracles of four living adopted children, one frozen embryo, uh, adoption still waiting to be born, three biological children, at the time I read uh, your notes, it was eight grandchildren. I don't know if that's grown any, but God's still, still eight. <laughs> still eight. God's still not and done. And one, one of them is adopted. <laughs> oh, so. praise God. But he is, he, yeah. is, he is still not done with you. You and your husband, he's called you even deeper uh, into the pro-life movement. I mean, you're, you're, you're living pro-life. You're living pro-love. You're sharing these things with, with children that might not other, uh, otherwise live. 
and yet he's called you to get into the political side of this, the whole, mm-hmm. the whole battle of, of, of abortion, Roe versus Wade. Tell me about how that took place. Uh, honestly, that was, that was crazier to us than what we've been doing with babies. So, had, you felt, um, had you felt political before, or were we just doing what God was calling you to do as a family? Had you felt that you were somehow involved in the political movement of pro-life? You know, we had a lot of people say things to us that eventually we would, that we'd be part of legislation and things like that. But we were, we thought, yeah, Too busy, I, don't, yeah. I don't know about that yet. Um, you know, we were part of, um, I'm a strong advocate for the Bound for Life movement, which is the red tape. They stand in mm. front of the um, uh, Supreme Court and pray. We, we had that chapter. We stood in front of clinics and things like that. But no, nothing really political. Um, what happened was um, we we had had somebody approach us and they had said we had been at an event and they had said uh, that they were surprised that Roe v. Wade had never been challenged mm-hmm. and they felt that Denny and I would be a part of that. And we had heard this over and over in different ways over the years, but this time I I had been in touch with Alan Parker from the Justice Foundation. And so I was able to go back to an email thread and find him. And I thought, well, let's just figure this out right now, if this is even possible, to challenge Roe v. Wade. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Because I had no clue what that meant. And so I emailed him and never thought, yeah, I figured, oh, he's far too busy. Busy. Why would he answer such a question? And he did. He began sending me things. And um, so then Denny and I, my husband started really praying into it saying, okay, Lord, is there, is there something that the pro-life movement hasn't done? And um, one morning, uh, March 9th, to be exact of 2017, I want to say, I woke up and just really felt encouraged to just really pray and press into this. And I started asking the Lord, is there strategy? Give me some kind of strategy if this is something we're supposed to be involved in. And I instantly started seeing that scene in the um, Amazing Grace movie where William Wilberforce Mm -hmm. was rolling out his petition before Parliament to overturn the slave trade. I kept seeing that scene over and over and over. So I called my husband and I said, I think the Lord wants us to petition the Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade like Wilberforce petitioned Parliament to overturn the slave trade. So we immediately contacted Alan and asked him. And uh, I was like, "Is has a petition ever been done? There's lots of petitions. Mm-hmm. But has anybody went right to the source to say, we don't agree with what you did. We need this overturned. So that's how it began. Uh, We started the petition, wrote the petition a few weeks later, and uh, we now have almost a half a million signatures on it. And it has been, I know you've interviewed Alan, Mm -hmm. so um, his interview would explain a little bit more about it. Mm -hmm. But um, no one thought it could be done. Everyone said, you can't petition the Supreme Court this way, but we've done it. And every time there's a case we send our petitions in with everyone, all the petitioners' names. And um, it's been a powerful, powerful yeah. thing. I, in the very, <clears throat> at, at one level, to me, it has created a bit of a groundswell because we have those names on a document and they are, these people are praying in unity mm-hmm. for Roe v. Wade to actually be overturned. I know that we've. I know that the pro-life movement has been doing this for year years, but I feel like this was a culmination of something that was really powerful, and we've seen powerful things happening from it. Well, when Justice Scalia, when he was alive, it, it, uh, he was he was not for abortion, and he said, right. "But uh, where's the moral outcry? Where's the yes. people of America screaming that this should be overturned? That this this is not right?" And right. I think that's, that's that's where your name came from. I, I know there was a, there was yes. a. a uh, there's been a lot of petitions, but in this case, that petition is inserted in, in, in any case that comes before the Supreme Court that has to do with, with, uh, with abortion or with Roe v. Roe v. Wade. 
And we did uh, interview Alan Parker, his, and again, his interview is available on YouTube any time somebody wants to see it. But the, he, is a, he is an attorney who's tried cases before the Supreme Court. He knows yes. what he's doing. And somehow yes. God put the two of you together. And yes. uh, that, that in itself is probably a miracle. But tell me about the petition. How, I mean, we know that it's different from the standpoint that it's inserted with, with every case. How is it, uh, how, what is the moral outcry? I mean, why is, why is anybody's opinion on this petition any different than, than just saying, I just don't agree with it? So the petition is based on, um, you know, Plessy versus Ferguson had a 58-year-old um, precedent <laughs> that withdrew any protection from people, which um, is our first pillar, that it's a crime against humanity. Alan explains this much more eloquently mm -hmm. than I do. But basically, it was fifty a 58-year law, and they came in with um, evidence to prove, no, these people need your protection, our protection, and they overturned the law. So because mm -hmm. of that, we knew that this could be overturned. So that's the first pillar. There's five pillars that uphold the petition. Um, other pillars are um, the safe haven laws. Every state has a safe haven law. So if any woman feels that she is unable to parent her child, she can relinquish that child to a safe place right. uh, after a certain number of days of giving birth. And there will be no questions asked. She is totally released from it. Um, and then those babies are available for adoption. Um, and then there's also that this is uh, abortion hurts women. We sure. have uh, over 4,000 <clears throat> affidavits from women who have had abortions and how it has damaged their lives and injured them. Um, that is a scientific evidence, you know. And then the, then the actual scientific evidence that this yeah. is life in the womb. I mean, we are taking babies out of the womb right now to operate on them and putting them back in. I mean, these are babies. You know that, yes. We knew yes. that. We, I think and we knew that in 1972, 73. I think we knew that. We didn't want yes. to. We didn't want to admit to it. But now, with ultrasounds yes. and all the other technology, there's no denying that it's a baby. No, no. And social media shows you that everybody believes that this is a baby. Yeah. Every woman is out there advertising her her pregnancy stick. I'm I'm having a baby. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and then the last uh, petition is that there is over a million families desiring to adopt a newborn. Yes at any given time. And so we do feel that this is an adoption movement that's rising up too, that that's an answer to uh, the ending of abortion right. as well. Yeah, the, the, just the desire for adoption. I think uh, it's, it's known that uh, Christians across the board, uh, worldwide and domestically, adopt more children than, than any other group. And there's a lot of them waiting to adopt. And I think there's probably a lot of them out there that don't have, have no idea that they're gonna adopt a baby. But God's going to speak right. to them like he did you and Dennis. Yes. <laughs> He's going to surprise yes. them. <laughs> and some have been have had this desire to adopt. I talked to many women who feel like they were told when they were children that they would adopt children. Mm -hmm. So I just hope to be uh, more helpful to get this word out that you can adopt. Well, I think the, the environment right now to uh, at least throw abortion back to the states and make it a state law, a state enforced, whatever, or overturn it. I think we're in a, an environment right now, just from a social justice standpoint, that we can say, "Hey, this is a this is a crime against humanity. It's a crime against women. Fifty percent mm -hmm. of the people involved in abortion die. It's not health care. We can't say that right. anymore. But right. if it's if it's overturned tomorrow, next week, mm -hmm. we have all of these women who are either going to break and everybody say, "Well, we just break the law and get an abortion anyway," or they're going to choose some other other route. They're going to they're going to raise their child or they're gonna put it up for adoption. Two very, very different things and very different needs for these ladies. Uh, mm -hmm. Is the church ready for that? I mean, we need to step up at that point, I think. Well, <clears throat> I, have, um, I have strong faith in the church because the word says that they will be glorious. And so maybe right this minute, I don't think they're ready, but we tend to just as humanity that when we're put in a position we rise to the occasion. Mm -hmm. So I do think that the church will rise to the occasion. Um, I think that there's a lot of things that make people feel like um, adoption is impossible or that it's uh, scary and all those things. So a lot of it is just educating. And that's something my husband and I do. We travel 
the nation. We go into churches and we educate people on why abortion is where it's at and what we can do as far as uh, obviously signing the petition at the moraloutcry.com and then saying yes to this harvest of children that's available to us right now and it's going to be exponentially available when Roe v. Wade is overturned. So what do you say in a, in a church uh, girl comes up to you and says, I haven't told anybody this, but I, I'm, I've got an unwanted pregnancy. What would you say to her right now? Um, well, first thing, obviously, I would pray over her and then just listen to her and see how she's mm-hmm. feeling. When a woman is first finds out um, there's so many emotions uh, that's not necessarily the time to seal a deal on whether she's going to keep or uh, place the baby for adoption. Um, so walking through it with her, mm-hmm. being close to her, obviously taking her and letting her see an ultrasound. Mm-hmm. Um, so many of our crisis pregnancy or, or pregnancy resource centers, they all are equipped for this. And they are, uh, all the counselors are wonderful, godly women that can walk her through Mm -hmm. that. And then we need the church to rise up and take her under their wing, you know? And so I, that's one of the number one calls that I get um, on a monthly basis Mm -hmm. of that. There's a young girl that's in a crisis and what can I, is there any resources for her? Now, if that girl, if that girl does decide on adoption, I mean, adoptions are so much different than they were back in the, 40s and 50s and people coming out of children's homes and different things Uh, there was a stigma attached to being adopted and now it's Mm -hmm. it's, it's everybody realizes what a beautiful thing that is but at the same time she's giving this baby up for adoption she can choose the family now it can be an open adoption but when she gives birth and that baby goes away there's a grieving process for her how do you minister to her how do you minister to her just you know what it's just loving that person, no matter what somebody's going through, just lis- listening and being a shoulder and just loving them. Um, and adoption, like you said, is very different. Um, open adoptions are the norm now. Mm-hmm. Uh, girls don't have to give their baby up for adoption and then never hear from them again. They can be part of that family and part of that child's life still if that's what they desire. And so there is um, hope at the end, and it's a very courageous thing to do to place your child up for adoption. And so um, I think the church is going to, I think we're going to rise up and we're going to be that, all that the Lord has called us to be, and comfort those that mourn. I I, I agree with you. I believe it too. Thank you so much for all that you and your family and your husband are doing. Thank you. We appreciate it. Once again, it's moraloutcry.com. Uh, the audience can go there and sign the petition and to tell people why they think abortion is wrong. Thank you again, Mindy. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you. For more information on Moral Outcry and how you can get involved, you can connect to this website. In this season in our country, it's not enough just to speak out about a topic. We need to get involved. Also, I'd encourage you to get involved with supporting Viewpoint. Go to WTLW.com for more information on how to support this program. Thanks for watching. I'm Bob Placey.